Hi, my name's Chris and I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is Melbourne Cup Day 1995. Today we're going to be looking at a workshop on the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is a workshop that we do for area assemblies around Australia. Hi, my name's David, I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date's the 25th of May 1993. One of the first things we see when we first start coming to AA meetings is this, usually these two big banners on the wall somewhere. One is the 12 steps and the other is the 12 traditions. There's often very, uh, some other banners around, a serenity prayer and maybe some others, but these are the ones that tend to dominate AA meetings on the walls. So today we're going to have a look at the, at the second one of those, the 12 traditions. Um, the 12 steps were created back in the 1930s and are the program of recovery for AA members. Uh, the 12 traditions were created later and uh, Bill W wrote a book to introduce those traditions to the fellowship, which was published in about 1952, okay. So the 12 steps really is what I first want to know about when I came to AA. I came into AA, I'd been drinking for 17 years and the last three of those years, I was desperately trying to stop drinking. And I started to identify with people in AA. The first step, I heard people talking about the problem and I identified with the two aspects that AA talks about, the physical craving. As an alcoholic, I don't drink like other people. Whenever I start drinking, whenever I take alcohol, I get this craving to keep going. And I realized I'm not alone. Other people have that same reaction, that same abnormal reaction to alcohol. The second thing I identified with is when people talked about this mental obsession. So even though I got to a point in my drinking where I made the same decision not to drink anymore, and I would stop for short periods of time, I'd always go back to doing it again. And AA talked about this mental obsession, this urge, this memory to go back and do it again. And I'd eventually always do that insane thing and pick up again. So that's how I understood the problem. I identify with other people uh, when they're sharing about that and saying, yeah, that's me and I'm powerless over alcohol. The next thing I got, of course, in AA was some hope because here were some people who'd been through the same and similar things to me and they weren't drinking and they were happy about not drinking. And that gave me some hope that maybe it was possible, possible for me to recover. So that's step two. And the thing about step two, I need to have an open mind, open enough to listen to what's working for other people. Uh, the good thing about it is I get to choose my own conception of what that higher power is. AA doesn't try and tell me what to believe, but it does suggest I need to believe in something. And for me, this step comes from the inspiration I get when I go to lots of meetings and I meet people who are in recovery, who are getting on with life. And I think, well, maybe that's possible for me. Then I get to a decision, step three, where I make a decision. Um, and to me, that's a decision. And I know I'm powerless. I've now got some hope that this program will work. So it's a decision to take a spiritual path in life, to try and live by some spiritual principles. My principles, not being told what to do by other people, but to try and live a spiritual way of life. And to me, that's then a commitment to go on with the rest of the program. I don't know how to live a spiritual, pro a spiritual life. I've never done it off my own bat before. So there's a series of spiritual exercises that AA suggests that I do to put me onto that spiritual path. Then the bit that I, want, I balk at is this middle steps, which are a series of house cleaning steps uh, where I need to take inventory and share it with someone else and I become willing to change and I ask for help and I look for the harm I've done to other people in the past and I make amends. And where I really want to get to is these last three steps. But these the, the steps 10 and 11 become my daily routine of uh, continuing some inventory on a daily basis, prayer and meditation on a, on a daily basis. And by the time I got to this point in the program, the revolutionary change that had been promised in the book and by people in the AA had come about and I'd stopped obsessing about alcohol. And, uh, and to me, that was an amazing thing, to have that revolutionary change. And really what I want to do then is go out and help the next person, pass this message on to the next person which is what that last step is about, carrying the message to the next person. I remember being early days in AA and I'd had this really huge change in my outlook on life and I was going to lots of meetings and I was really enthusiastic about helping the next person, carrying the message. I want to go out and to pubs and drag people, people in, you know, alcoholics into AA and get them sober and stuff like that. And, and to me, this is the most powerful step of all. That last step 
you know, it keeps me sober long term, is carrying the information, carrying this message onto the next alcoholic. I pretty quickly worked out though, is that in AA's experience, the best way to do that is to carry the message is not just by myself, but as a group. You know, a group of us are much better at carrying the message than me as an individual. And, uh, uh, and that's where I really needed to learn something about the traditions and become part of AA, part of a group. So the 12 steps are described in the book, the 12 and 12, this is how it's, they're described. AA's 12 steps are a group of principles, spiritual in their nature, which, if practised as a way of life, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. So the 12 steps are my personal program of recovery. It's for me, that's how I, how I get well and can start, be, and start becoming uh, happily and useful in society. The traditions are quite different from that. They're not a personal program. They apply actually to the groups. So this is what the 12 and 12 says about the 12 traditions. AA's 12 traditions apply to the life of the fellowship itself. They outline the means by which AA maintains its unity and relates to the world about it, the way it lives and grows. So the traditions are about the groups and the fellowships. It's how we maintain unity and it's how AA grows. So we're going to go through this workshop and go through each tradition one by one. So the obvious place to start is with tradition one. So this is tradition one. Our common welfare should come first. Personal recovery depends upon AA unity. So that tradition, as read, is the short form of the tradition. It's what we see on the banners that we see in our AA meetings. But for each tradition, there are two forms. There's a short form on the banners, and then there's a longer form that gives us more information. Each member of Alcoholics Anonymous is but a small part of a great whole. AA must continue to live or most of us will surely die. Hence, our common welfare comes first, but individual welfare follows close afterward. So tradition one is about unity. In fact, all the traditions are about unity. That's their purpose, is to create unity in AA. <clears throat> you may have heard of AA's three legacies, you know, and there's, there's the symbol that sometimes you see around AA of unity, service and recovery. These are the three legacies of AA. The basis of the three legacies is the one on the bottom, so that's recovery. Without recovery, we have nothing. And the thing that allows us to, to get recovery is the 12-step program. The second of the three legacies is unity. And the 12 traditions are what helps AA create unity. The third of the three legacies is about service. And there's another set of 12, uh, a set of banners that we don't often see around, but it's actually about the 12 concepts for world service. We have another workshop on that you might want to have a look at some other time. But those are the three, uh, three uh, uh, legacies. And in terms of the traditions, the traditions, the main purpose of the traditions is to create unity in AA so that we can grow. I'll just come, we'll go through the rest of the traditions and I'll, we'll come back at the end to look at tradition one and how all the other traditions contribute back into tradition one. So, tradition two. For our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. Our leaders are but trusted servants. They do not govern. So that's the short form of Tradition 2, and this is the long form. For our group purpose, there is but one ultimate authority, a loving God as he may express himself in our group conscience. You may have noticed quite quickly there that there's something strange. The, short, for the long form of the Tradition 2 is actually shorter than the short form. Um, something alcoholic about that. But uh, that last sentence of the the long form of tradition too about our leaders are but trusted servants, they do not govern, that actually appears in the long form of a different tradition, tradition nine. It doesn't get lost. But uh, <clears throat> so tradition two is about who is the ultimate authority in AA. So we have this group, here's our AA group, and tradition two su suggests that the leaders serve the group and there is no government. Uh, the ultimate authority for the group is a loving God expressed through the group conscience. 
So when the group gets together and holds a group conscience meeting, what we are trying to do is to find out the will of this loving God expressed through our group conscience. So here's the representation of our loving God up there. I don't know what he looks like, but we'll just put, a, put, a, put him in a cloud <laughs> up in the sky. And uh, so when the group has that group conscience, it's a good thing for me to re remember when I'm in a group conscious meeting is that that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to find out God's will for the group. Uh, we'll move on to tradition three. The only requirement for AA membership is a desire to stop drinking. So tradition three is about who gets to join AA and how we join AA. So... Basically, when AA was first around, uh, AA was growing quite quickly and little groups were popping up all over North America, starting in Akron and then New York and then uh, Cleveland in Ohio and then growing quickly. And each of the groups, because they were autonomous and each group was, was separate, they, they tended to make up their own rules about who was allowed to join and who wasn't allowed to join. And uh, there was all sorts of different rules that they had. At one point, Bill W. wrote to all the groups and said, you know, combine, let's combine all those rules together, find if we can find out some sort of consensus. And basically worked out that if everyone applied all the rules, then no one would be able to join AA. So the whole thing was turned on its head and said there are no rules for joining AA, that anyone who has a desire to stop drinking can join AA just because they say so. So here's a guy who comes along and says, I want to stop drinking, can I join? And that's all that's necessary, you're in. That's it, you're a member of AA, you're a member of this AA group. <clears throat> so membership is open to anyone who wants to stop drinking. The long form of Tradition 3 goes on and actually starts talking about how group, uh, the group itself is formed. Our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism. Hence, we may refuse none who wish to recover. Nor ought AA membership ever depend upon money or conformity. Any two or three alcoholics gathered together for sobriety may call themselves an AA group, provided that, as a group, they have no other affiliation. So how does an AA group form? Well, we've got a couple of people here. One says, I want to stay sober. The other one says, so do I. Uh, let's help each other. Let's form an AA group. And as soon, as soon as two or more people say that and say they want to form an AA group and stay sober and help other people, then they're an AA group. That's it. That's all that's required. They don't have to register with a central office or tell anybody else. They just, because they want to stay sober and help each other, they can call themselves an AA group. Okay? There's no other authority which decides who is an AA group and who isn't, and there's no requirement to register or ask permission. Of course... In most cases, it's a very good idea to do that, you know, so that other people know where your meeting is and those types of things. Get in contact with the local central office, um, you know, uh, and actually make connections with the rest of AA. But in order to call yourself an AA group, that, that isn't actually a requirement. An example I know of, a country town here in Victoria, Australia, a place in Malmesbury, there was a group there that functioned for a long, long time. Uh, they met in a local church hall and they advertised in their local newspaper every Thursday at this church hall there's an AA meeting and they never connected with any other group they were, were didn't uh, weren't in a meetings book anywhere um, but were they an AA group yes they were because they declared that they were an AA group they were trying to help alcoholics they were advertising in, you know, in the local newspaper and so they were an AA group so if you if you are starting an AA, a new AA group though I would recommend though that you do get connected because there's lots of advantages in doing that but the point about this is you know, an AA group just can form by itself, doesn't need permission. So that's tradition three. Then tradition four. Each group should be autonomous except in matters affecting other groups or AA as a whole. Each group is autonomous and can run their affairs in any way they see fit. It's up to their own group conscience. And of course, every other group is autonomous too. So each of these little groups has their own group conscience and is running along the lines that they decide to through their own group conscience. Um, every now and again, you know, that can cause some conflict because one group might be doing something that's interfering with the, other, with the way another group might be, uh, might be uh, functioning. And, uh, but what, so what happens if a group starts to sort of step out of line and start affecting other groups? 
Um, the other groups might get a bit upset with that. But the tradition four, uh, on the one hand, it's saying that each group is autonomous, but uh, the tradition four goes on to explain how we can keep unity. So this is the long form. With respect to its own affairs, each AA group should be responsible to no other authority than its own conscience. But when its plans concern the welfare of neighbouring groups also, those groups ought to be consulted. So most of what a group does, you know, it's up to their own group conscience, but if the group is, a, is going to do something or is doing something that's affecting other local groups, then there's a responsibility to consult with the other group. So here's a little member going along to these other group consciences and saying, here's what we plan to do, what do you think about it? And actually getting the feedback from the various groups around. Then he can come back to his own home group and say, well, here's what the other groups around here thought about this. And the, the group can then form their own group conscience, a better informed group conscience about how they're behaving and what they're doing in their neighbourhood. Of course, if the group is doing something you know, that's going to affect not just the local groups, but a, but a larger, a larger uh, area, then the group can send along there a representative to a local area assembly. That representative is known as a, a GSR, a group service representative, and can go to the area and talk to other members there, other area uh, GSRs, and tell the area uh, how the, gro the group is going and what they're doing, and again, bring feedback back to the group conscience and to have a, a more informed group conscience about what they're doing, what direction they're taking. Then again, if they're actually doing something that's, that's affecting mu a much greater area, like the whole of the country, in, in our case, the whole of Australia, then those ideas can actually be taken you know, through the Area Assembly, through a delegate to the, uh, to the National Conference, which meets once a year. This is what the uh, long form goes on to say. And no group, regional committee or individual should ever take any action that might greatly affect AA as a whole without conferring with the trustees of the General Service Board. On such issues, our common welfare is paramount. So once again, that can, you can get advice, a group can get advice through that General Service structure or maybe directly by contacting the General Service Office and get advice uh, from the, uh, the General Service Board. And then, <laughs> and then the, that member can actually go back to his home group and say, well, here's what the rest of AA thought about our idea. And this is the responsibility in Tradition 4 is to actually consult as widely as possible uh, when, when our actions are, are going to affect other groups and the rest of AA. Now, it could be that this group you know, might go through all that process and every other group, they say, we're going to go down this particular path and all the other local groups say, no, you shouldn't do that, that won't work. And they go along to the area assembly and the area assembly says, don't do that, that won't work. You know, it's the wrong way to go. And they go to conference and once again, the conference says, you're all wrong, you shouldn't do that. And uh, everyone says, this is a bad idea. But in the end, when it gets back to the group, the group might look at that and say, well, we're going to go ahead and do it anyway. Our responsibility is to actually consult widely. We've done that, but we think that we're on, the, we're on the right path. Now, it could be that that particular group is very sick and they're on the wrong path and they don't know what they're doing, but at least they've, they've um, uh, complied with tradition four by consulting widely. On the other hand, it could be that that group is actually on, the, on a good spiritual path and they know more about this than the rest of Australia. <laughs> And it's actually the right thing to do. And it's not up to anybody else apart from their group conscience to tell them that they're right and wrong. We express our opinions about it and as long as that goes back to their group conscience, it's their responsibility you know, to take, take to the decision uh, according to their own group conscience. Pretty amazing thing to happen to, for an organisation to work that way, you know, that there is no governing body, that each individual group can run their affairs in their, in their own way Okay, and as long as they can consult with other groups if it's going to be affecting other groups. So when the rest of AA will be affected, a group should take into consideration the concerns of all the other groups, the conference and the board. Tradition five. Each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. So traditions 
five is about our purpose. What are we here for? What's a group here for? What's the whole of AA here for? This is the long form. Each Alcoholics Anonymous group ought to be a spiritual entity having but one primary purpose, that of carrying its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. So here's our group. Each group is a spiritual entity. It's connected to its higher power through the group conscience. Its purpose is to carry its message to alcoholics. And how does it do that? And what is the message? The message is the message of the 12 steps of recovery. Without the 12 steps in recovery, there is no message to, really to carry. How do we do that? Well, various ways. The most obvious one is by holding meetings, you know, uh, open meetings and closed meetings where we're carrying that message to the still suffering alcoholic. Other ways we carry the message is by visiting hospitals and rehabs, taking the message into those places or prisons or uh, doing 12 step calls, getting involved with uh, a local uh, district or, or central office who's answering phone calls and going out and visiting people in their homes or answering people who uh, ring up AA helplines. And of course, there's public information. We carry the message uh, in a public way. Um, now, all of those things are the responsibility of the groups to do. Some of those things, though, it's very often uh, more efficient for groups to get to do together to, form, to do those functions, like organising rosters into hospitals and, and prisons and things like that. Some groups are big enough to do it themselves. Uh, others, you know, it's better to get involved with a district or a central office or an intergroup and uh, organise to do these things that way. But the, that's our purpose, is to carry this message to the alcoholic who still suffers, the alcoholic who hasn't yet heard the message from us. Tradition six. An AA group ought never endorse, finance or lend the AA name to any related facility or outside enterprise, lest problems of money, property and prestige divert us from our primary purpose. So this tradition is about not being diverted from our primary purpose. We know from Tradition 5 our primary purpose is to carry the message. There are a bunch of these traditions which warn us against certain actions that will divert us from our primary purpose. This is the long form. Problems of money, property and authority may easily divert us from our primary spiritual aim. We think, therefore, that any considerable property of genuine use to AA should be separately incorporated and managed, thus dividing the material from the spiritual. An AA group, as such, should never go into business. So the AA group is a spiritual entity. It's not a business or a social club. It's not a legal entity. It can't own a photocopier or rent a building or employ someone. So Tradition 6 tells us how we are to organise those things. These are the things that belong to AA, but need a legal entity to own them and run them. Things of value to AA should be managed by a separately incorporated body. What are things that are of value to AA? Things like property, leases, contracts with the telephone company. And then, of course, there's the intellectual property of AA, our ownership of our own literature, our big book and all the other literature that we have. Now, these things need to be owned by a legal entity. If I was an employee of an AA office, I don't want to be employed by a spiritual entity that has no legal standing. I want to be employed by a legal entity that has to abide by the laws of the land and pay my superannuation and you know, look after the health and safety, all of those things. Okay? And that needs to be done by a separately incorporated body. And Tradition 6 allows us to do that. Then Tradition 6 goes on and talks about things that actually aren't part of AA. Secondary aids to AA, such as clubs or hospitals, which require much property or administration, ought to be incorporated, and so set apart that, if necessary, they can be freely discarded by the groups. Hence, such facilities ought not to use the AA name. Their management should be the sole responsibility of those people who financially support them. For clubs, AA managers are usually preferred but hospitals as well as other places of recuperation ought to be well outside AA and medically supervised. While an AA group may cooperate with anyone, such cooperation ought never go so far as affiliation or endorsement. 
actual or implied. An AA group can bind itself to no one. So the second part of the long form of Tradition 6 is referring to activities that should not be part of AA. Activities that shouldn't be run by an AA group because they're not actually part of carrying the message. Some examples of that are when AA, and this was happening when AA was early around, uh, they had great ambitions, wanted to go out and set up hospitals and send out missionaries and all sorts of things. But they found if, you, if we start running hospitals or even opening a clubhouse, uh, um, which is a social club rather than you know, an AA group carrying the message, these things are useful to alcoholics, but they're not part of our primary purpose. And if we start running those things, then we get diverted from our primary purpose. This tradition suggests that we don't get involved with these outside en enterprises in case we get diverted from our primary purpose. There's a few examples of that. I know here in, here in Melbourne, Australia, there's a couple of rehabs that were set up. They were set up by AA members, but they've never been part of AA. They're a rehab that's set up as a separate thing. Uh, one of them is the MARP, Maroondah Alcohol Recovery Program. Okay, And it's basically a set of houses, dry houses, uh, that helps alcoholics. The purpose of that group is not to carry the message that they're not part of AA. It was set up by AA members, but it was incorporated separately. This tradition suggests that we should cooperate with organisations like that, but they're not part of AA, and they shouldn't have the AA name associated with them. Once again, there are things like AA clubhouses. There was a, uh, an Alano club here in Melbourne, uh, which was basically a, a social club. Most of its members were AA members. Some were actually al members as well. But it wasn't part of carrying the message, and it was separate. They, their finances were separate. Everything was separate from AA. Once again, it's nice for us to cooperate, but they, can't, they shouldn't use our name. This tradition suggests that we keep those things separate and that they don't use Alcoholics Anonymous in their names. Of course, we can meet in their buildings and cooperate in that way, and that can be very useful, uh, but they're not part of AA. In that way, we can get on with our primary purpose of carrying the message. Tradition 7. Every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. So this one is about money and about how we support ourselves. And this is the long form. The AA groups themselves ought to be fully supported by the voluntary contributions of their own members. We think that each group should soon achieve this ideal, that any public solicitation of funds using the name of Alcoholics Anonymous is highly dangerous whether by groups, clubs, hospitals or other outside agencies. That acceptance of large gifts from any source or of contributions carrying any obligations, whatever, is unwise. Then, too, we view with much concern those AA treasuries which continue beyond prudent reserves to accumulate funds for no stated AA purpose. Experience has often warned us that nothing can so surely destroy our spiritual heritage as futile disputes over property, money and authority. When AA was first forming in the beginning of the last century, they had some really big ideas. I was mentioned it before about opening hospitals, employing people, sending them out to carry the message, you know, missionaries they were calling them. And so with these big ideas, they went to the richest man in the world and said, we're going to need a lot of money to do this. And uh, fortunately for AA, you know, that was Rockefeller. And he looked at AA and AA's spiritual program and said, no, I'm not going to give you a bunch of uh, money because yours is a spiritual program and the money might spoil it. What you need to do is to be self-supporting. And this was a really great thing that Rockefeller did for AA is not give us the money. <laughs> okay. So this tradition suggests that money from other sources might make us beholden to something other than our higher power. If some rich person, a Rockefeller or some other philanthropist, gives us money, or if we take money from a government uh, program, right, we might start being beholden to someone else. Okay? We might start thinking, oh, okay, we want to adjust our message in some way just to keep that person, the person with the purse strings, happy. You know, we might ask for a government grant and the, and the government department might say, look, you know, we want you to you know, change it a bit, stop talking about that higher power so much and, and concentrate on this part, of, uh, this part of the population or things like that. And be, if they're giving us money, we might be tempted to change our message or change the way we carry our message. 
So this tradition suggests that we don't do that, that we only take contributions from Alcoholics Anonymous members. So we don't take money from outside, and then each group needs to be self-supporting, not dependent on anything other than its own resources. We need to put our hands in our own pockets. I know when I was a practicing alcoholic, I was a taker, you know, dependent on other people, you know, um, a burden on society. And this tradition allows, it reminds me that now that I'm sober, I need to stand up and take responsibility for my own life and for my own sobriety. And each group needs to take responsibility for itself. Another thing about that too is that each group needs to contribute its share for the services it uses. So if my local group, my, the group that I'm a member of, we like the fact that there's a local central office that answers telephones, okay, because they pass on the 12-step calls onto our group. So we're using their service and to be responsible and to be self-supporting, we need to contribute something to that local telephone service or central office. We also like the fact that we have a GSR and we, that goes along to our local area uh, and that area has expenses and actually has to pay for the delegate to go to the national conference once a year. And we think that that's really valuable to our group. So we need to contribute to those things. To be self-supporting, we need to contribute to our local area. And once again, we like the fact that there's a national office that supplies our literature and does all sorts of other things. We like the fact that there's a national conference where AA members can share with each other about uh, what's going on in their groups and about the direction that AA is taking. Now, so because we like that and we think it's really valuable, our group needs to contribute to those things in order to be self-supporting. First thing we need to look after is our own financial needs. Okay, we need to pay the rent on our building, we need to buy the tea and coffee, you know, supply the literature, those types of things, and our own 12-step activity. But also, we need to be responsible for those other services in AA that we use as a group. That way we can, once again, Get on with it, carrying our message, our primary purpose. Tradition eight. Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional, but our service centres may employ special workers. So tradition eight is about what AA pays people to do, pays members to do, and what we don't. It's not to be confused with what members might do outside of AA, employed by hospitals or rehabs or those types of things. It's not about that at all. It's about what AA pays people to do. And so this is the long form. Alcoholics Anonymous should remain forever non-professional. We defy professionalism as the occupation of cancelling alcoholics for fees or hire. But we may employ alcoholics where they are going to perform no services for which we might otherwise have to engage non-alcoholics. Such special services may be well recompensed, but our usual AA 12-step work is never to be paid for. When I get sober, there's a lot of work to be done you know, to help AA grow, to carry this message to the next alcoholic. Lots of different tasks that I can get involved with uh, in doing service. But I'd like to divide them up into two different types of service. One is 12-step work, and the other is service to AA. 12-step work is you know, part of my program. You know, part of my program to stay sober, part of my 12 steps, is step 12, carrying the message. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. So this type of work is the thing that keeps me sober long term. It's part of my program. There's also another part of service, things that need to be done in order for AA to actually function. And, and there's another banner that you occasionally see in meetings that covers that. I am responsible. When anyone, anywhere, reaches out for help, I want the hand of AA always to be there. And for that, I am responsible. So here's a bunch of things that we might be doing. And these things are related to 12-step work, carrying the message, like sharing at a meeting, being a sponsor talking to newcomers, visiting people in a hospital or prison, uh, writing a story for a local newsletter, AA newsletter, uh, making 12-step calls to someone's home, answering an AA telephone helpline, uh, being a guest speaker, uh, or loaning someone your big book. All of that type of service is directly about carrying the message to the still-suffering alcoholic. 
The other types of service we do are things like this, being the secretary of a group or, or the, group, uh, the group service representative for that group, or organising the, the hospital or prison rosters, publishing newsletters, washing the dishes, cleaning up and stacking the chairs, being a treasurer or a bookkeeper, running an AA office or selling literatures. So you see those things aren't directly about carrying the message, but they support the members and the groups to carry the message. Now, to me, what Tradition 8 is about is looking at those various things that we do and saying the things that are about carrying the message, we never pay people to do. So we never pay people to do those things on the left-hand side in the pink. But it is possible for us to pay people, in some cases, to do those other things, those serv the service to AA that could actually be done by someone who's not an AA member. The 12-step work can only really be done by an AA member, but other types of work that, that, that keeps AA functioning could be done by someone else. Maybe not being a secretary or a GSR, you know, uh, because you've got to be intimately involved with the group, but you can imagine actually paying someone to publish a newsletter or, uh, or being a treasurer. We do actually employ people to run offices and you know, we employ AA, an AA member is very often the person who, is an, who does the auditing of the books you know, it's, you know, and we pay that person to do that because it's a professional service. Okay? Not very often we pay someone to wash the dishes. That's usually a good job for, to give to newcomers or to remind old timers that, uh, that we're all the same and we all need to uh, chip in and do our part. Um, but to me, that's what Tradition 8 is all about, dividing those things up. We never pay people to do the things on the left-hand side, that 12-step work. But some of those things in the service aspect that keeps AA running, we can pay people to do. Tradition 9. AA as such should never be organised but we may create service boards or committees directly responsible to those they serve. So this tradition is about the structure of AA. And I want to actually compare it to some other structures of organisations we see around the world. You probably recognise this symbol. You know, there are McDonald's restaurants all around the world. Okay? There are actually, you know, do you know there's three times as many AA meetings in the world as there are McDonald's restaurants? That's an interesting fact. But they're all around the world. And uh, the way that an organisation like that runs is that there's a head office which sets the menu and the prices and basically control is coming from the top. And uh, you can't just open a McDonald's restaurant without permission. As you can an AA group, you can just say, we're an AA group and open up. You don't have to ask anybody. If you tried to open up a hamburger uh, restaurant and call yourself McDonald's, you'd be in a lot of legal problem because it's all controlled from the top. AA is not like this at all, not like that corporate structure with lots of branches. On the other hand, we may look at AA and say, well, there's some democratic principles going on in AA. We, we elect people, we vote people in to do certain jobs. So maybe we're like a democratic government. So with a democratic government, p power starts with the people and uh, they have an election and we choose representatives and form a government. And now we have a governing body and that government makes laws, collects taxes and keeps order. And the laws apply to everyone and people can be punished for not complying. And when we have a quick look at AA and we realise that there's some sort of structure, we might start to think that this is the way AA is structured, is that we have a governing body that we elect. Well, that's not the case at all either. AA doesn't have a governing body. So here's our group. Each group is autonomous self-supporting and has one primary purpose the and the ultimate authority for each group is this loving god expressed through the group conscience this is the long form of tradition nine each aa group needs the least possible organization rotating leadership is the best the small group may elect its secretary the large group its rotating committee and the groups of a large metropolitan area their central or intergroup committee which often employs a full-time secretary. Notice with Tradition 9, in the short form, it says AA as such ought never be organised, whereas the long form says that each AA group needs the least possible organisation. So which is it? Never organised or the least possible? There seems to be a conflict there, but when I really read it closely, I can see there's a difference. In the short form, it talks about AA as such, meaning AA as a whole, 
ought never be organised. So there's nothing, there's no governing body that sits above the groups telling them what to do. AA as a whole is never organised. But on the other hand, there does need to be some organisation for each group. Someone has to have the key to the venue and open up and set up the chairs and turn on the urn. Someone has to lead the meeting, you know, open the meeting and those things. Someone has to collect the money and put it in the bank. So there has to be, at group level, some organisation. This tradition suggests that should be the least possible organisation and suggests ways that we go about it. Things like rotating leadership and the small group may have a committee that organises those things. Then it goes on to suggest some other things. There are certain functions that can't actually be done by a group. Things like organising a local central office or intergroup. How is that organised? Well, this tradition starts to tell us about those things. A group of groups can get together and form a committee to form a local central office or intergroup. And a bunch of other groups could form another one. And what do central offices and intergroups generally do? Well, they're about providing services back to the group. Some examples are literature sales, you know, uh, selling the books, sourcing the books from the general service and, and selling them directly to the groups. Uh, publishing meetings lists and, and websites with meeting lists, publishing event listings and newsletters, and providing 12-step opportunities through a phone service, providing those opportunities back to the groups. That's generally what a central office or an intergroup committee or, uh, might be doing. On the other hand, you could also see around AA some other types of committees that are formed. A group of groups might to get, get together and form a district what do districts do? Well, generally, districts are about groups getting together to do stuff together. For example, you know, organising a hospital visit roster uh, or prison rosters or doing local public information or cooperating with professionals locally. So once again, it's about groups getting together uh, in order to do things together to carry the message. As well as this, and it's been mentioned before, is the areas. And the groups and the districts and the areas form part of the general service structure and feed into the conference. So more committees that are, that are set up in order for us to be able to communicate with each other. And of course, attached to that is, and part of the conference is the general service board. So what is the general service for? The trustees of the General Service Board are, in effect, our AA General Service Committee. They are the custodians of our AA tradition and the receivers of voluntary AA contributions by which we maintain our AA General Service Office at New York. They are authorised by the groups to handle our overall public relations and guarantee the integrity of our principal newspaper, the AA Grapevine. So the general service structure, which is the groups, the districts, the area, the conference, the general service board, you know, is the collective group conscience of AA. Not a governing body, but it's a collective group conscience. Uh, the general service board is responsible for the overall public relations. Uh, it publishes AA literature and is the custodians of the tradition. So it has a responsibility to point out to uh, groups or other committees and things in AA when uh, those groups are drifting away from traditions. So there is that responsibility, but they, they're not a governing body. Here in Australia, there's a general service manual, AA uh, manual, that gives us a whole lot of information about how that works. We're guided by the general service manual, as well as central office committees and uh, intergroups, as well as districts, areas, uh, conference, the general service structure. Sometimes you see these other committees form in AA and Tradition 9 allows us to do that. Some examples of those are one-off or annual events. Here in Victoria, there's an organisation, there's a, a, a committee called the VICIPA, Victorian Young People in AA, and they hold a convention one, once a year. There's a committee that does something. You know, they're not directly part of the general service structure. They're not associated with any you know, particular central office or anything like that, but they're, but they're doing something for AA and this tradition allows that to happen. Another example is a group that supports 
uh, meetings in a particular foreign language. There's a bunch of Spanish-speaking meetings here in Melbourne, and occasionally they'll get together and talk to each other about how to best carry the message to the Spanish-speaking population here in Melbourne. Another example is supporting a particular type of meeting here in Victoria, and actually it's one that spreads right throughout Australia, is a motorcycle group, the Chapter 6 Motorcycle Group. And there's a, group, a bunch of them, and they have a service body where every uh, once a year or so they get together and they talk about how they can best carry the message. These sorts of committees aren't part of the general service structure, but they're providing a service, they're, they're, uh, they're actually helping AA groups carry the message, so they're very valuable. And Tradition 9 allows us to do that form a committee just to help ourselves out. All such representatives are to be guided in the spirit of service. For true leaders in AA are but trusted and experienced servants of the whole. They derive no real authority from their titles. They do not govern. Universal respect is the key to their usefulness. So service is about this universal respect. We're guided by the spirit of service. And there are certain democratic principles that we uh, adhere to. One of those is making decisions with substantial unanimity. We don't just make decisions with a 51% majority. We try to have substantial majorities when we make big decisions in committees. Uh, there's also things like the third legacy procedure for elections. When we elect someone to do a job, if the election is really, really close and it can't be decided, we're looking for a two-thirds majority or something like that, then we'll have the election and then we'll have it again and again until we get a result. And if you do it three times and still don't get a clear winner, then we leave it up to a higher power and pull the name out of a hat instead. That's an amazing thing to, to see happen in an AA uh, group conscience. Uh, other things, some of the principles that we adhere to are ensuring that the minority voice is heard in AA. And the 12 concepts for world service, which is the other set of 12 things, our guides to lots of those things about uh, service in AA. The 12 concepts of world service are actually part of the general service manual. Notice there that universal respect is the key for these committees to, to function well. So AA as a whole is not organised, but groups and members form these various committees to serve the groups, in the case of central offices or intergroups, to enable groups to work together in the case of districts, to share our experience and ideas with each other in the case of areas and the general service structure. None of these have any authority over the groups and there is no government. Move on to Tradition 10. Alcoholics Anonymous has no opinion on outside issues. Hence, the AA name ought never be drawn into public controversy. So here's my AA group. Uh, its purpose is to carry this message to other alcoholics. Um, and then the group's going along, doing its best. And then the group might start discussing, well, what else can we do? Uh, and someone will come up with the idea, well, we should start lobbying the government to spend more on alcohol rehabs and things like that. And that might tend to make the group get involved with politics. Or someone says, drink driving laws are too harsh. Another one in the group starts saying, well, no, they should be strengthened. And we have these opinions about government laws in, in the country. And all, someone comes up with a bright idea that, that alcohol should be banned altogether. And if the AA group then starts lobbying governments and things to make those changes, then we can be diverted from our primary purpose. We might get involved with alcohol reform. Someone might then say, oh, AA is better than any religion and we ought to apply our program to solve all the world's problems rather than just put our effort into helping other alcoholics. And we get involved with criticising other religions or other people. Uh, and so a whole bunch of things we might start taking an interest in rather than carrying the message. Things like having an opinion about other fellowships or about how the local rehab is running their programs or criticising other people. This tradition suggests that we don't do that as a group. Right? These outside issues distract us from our primary purpose so that the general public see what we're doing and what's AA about? Well, it's a lobby group, isn't it? And here's a little alcoholic there you know, noticing this. What is that all? Where can I get some help? So the long form? 
No AA group or member should ever, in such a way as to implicate AA, express any opinion on outside controversial issues, particularly those of politics, alcohol reform or sectarian religion. The Alcoholics Anonymous groups oppose no one. Concerning such matters, they can express no views whatever. So this tradition suggests that we keep those things outside of AA. Each individual member can have political views and opinions about all sorts of things. But as a group, we have no opinion about any of those outside issues. We leave these things outside so that we can get on with our primary purpose of carrying the message. Tradition 11. Our public relations policy is based on attraction rather than promotion. We need always maintain personal anonymity at the level of press, radio and films. So these last two traditions are around anonymity. It's pretty important because it's actually part of our name. It's Alcoholics Anonymous. So I need to know about what, what, does, what is it talking about? What are we talking about when we're talking about remaining anonymous? This is the long form. Our relations with the general public should be characterised by personal anonymity. We think AA ought to avoid sensational advertising. Our names and pictures as AA members ought not be broadcast, filmed or publicly printed. Our public relations should be guided by the principle of attraction rather than promotion. There is never need to praise ourselves. We feel better to let our friends recommend us. So it suggests that we should avoid sensational advertising. So we don't do this. We don't go out and say, AA is the only way, we're the best, nothing else works, and sensationalise our message. But we do need to get the message out there. The message to the public is a simple one. If you want to stop drinking, AA may be able to help. And to me, this means that we need to do all we can to get this message out to the people who need it. Not in a sensational way, but in a calm and practical way. Lots of ways we do that in AA. You know, just the simple thing of putting an ad in your local newspaper. AA meets at this church hall on this night and inviting people to do it. These days, because local newspapers are dying off, you know, AA needs to be present on the internet and in social media in the sense of getting that message out that we exist and we're available for people who want to stop drinking. Again, not in a sensational way, but we need to be present in those places. It talks about the anonymity being at the level of press, radio and films. These days that also applies online. We shouldn't be putting our photographs or our full names in radio, press or on films or on the internet, but we do need to get that message out to let the public know that we still exist. A great example I know of is there was a new meeting starting, a women's meeting starting over in one of the suburbs in Melbourne, Williamstown, and uh, a group of women got together, we're going to start this new meeting, this new group, and uh, they bef even before the first meeting, they held their first meeting, they went to the local newspaper and said, would you like uh, to interview a recovered alcoholic? And there must have been a slow news day, <laughs> news week. That, and so they interviewed one of the members and her story. They didn't use her full name or her photograph, so she maintained her anonymity. But they told Deb's story in the article in the newspaper. And they said, there's a new group starting and gave the date and the time and the venue. And that meant at that group's very first meeting, there were half a dozen new members who showed up there wasn't done in a sensational way, so it's not going against Tradition 11, but it was getting out the message that it's possible to recover uh, and if you've got a drinking problem, AA may be able to help. I'd like to suggest that lots of groups could be doing more of that. You know, Once a year on your group anniversary, ring up your local newspaper and say, my AA group's been going for X amount of years. Would you like to interview a, a, a recovered alcoholic? And maybe one day they'll say yes. <laughs> if they don't, do it again the following year, but just keep that message out ticking over. Once again, not in a sensational way, though. I want AA to have this good reputation, so people, members of the public, know about AA. They need to know that we exist. You know, AA worked for a friend of mine. His doctor recommended it. I want doctors to be able to recommend us. I want doctors and health professionals in general, and lawyers and police, to know that we exist and that the AA program works. Someone might say, I've seen it in Bill on billboards. 
here in Melbourne and in actually, I know it's happening in Queensland as well, of uh, groups or, or committees, district committees, putting up billboards, not sensational advertising, just a simple message. If, if alcohol is costing you more than money, AA may be able to help and a, and a phone number. I want AA to have this good reputation that members of the public think, okay, it's, a, it's got a good reputation, I'll give it a try. Public anonymity is an important part of our public relations. And occasionally, someone steps out of AA and starts going public. Hey, my name's Frank Stepping Out, and I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And he gets the story in the newspaper with his full photograph and full name, and goes on radio, talks about his AA story, and then there's a program on TV, Frank Stepping Out's Battle with the Booze, all talking about AA. And what happens then? then the public start look, starts looking at that and saying, who's this guy, Frank, stepping out? And someone says, oh, he runs AA. He's the face of AA. And this tradition suggests that we don't do that, that we don't want any one person to become a spokesman or a boss of AA. Because what happens then? We may start following the individual rather than our higher power. If that starts happening, then someone else, another member will will step out as well and say, they'll all be, disagree with Frank and start saying, oh, I'm Jim Odart, that guy Frank has got it all wrong, my way of doing AA is better, he's doing the same thing out in the public arena and then they start arguing about who's doing it right, who's doing it wrong. Once again, we become more and more divided, let's follow Jim, let's follow Frank and the public gets this really mixed message about what AA is. Tradition 12 gives us some advice about this. Anonymity is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. And the long form? And finally, we of Alcoholics Anonymous believe that the principle of anonymity has an immense spiritual significance. It reminds us that we are to place principles before personalities, that we are actually to practice a genuine humility. This to the end that our great blessings may never spoil us, that we shall forever live in thankful contemplation of him who presides over us all. When we practice humility and become one amongst many, we become part of the group conscience and so connect with each other and to our higher power. We can then become united and can get on with our spiritual task of helping others. Once again... The traditions take us back to unity. They're about creating unity in AA. Back to tradition one, that unity. So how do the traditions and how does AA achieve unity? Well, it's to do with spiritual principles. And these traditions are spiritual principles and our singleness of purpose. These are the things that create unity. So the two fundamental principles of the 12 traditions are, first of all, our connection to a higher power, as expressed through tradition two. The ultimate authority is a loving God expressed through our group conscience. The second part is our singleness of purpose, as expressed in tradition five. Each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic. And the other traditions help us with those things. For example, we need to avoid the things that cut us off from that ultimate authority. So we need to avoid exclusion and outside affiliations, as in Tradition 3. Uh, we avoid taking money from outside organisations or individuals in Tradition 7. We avoid losing group autonomy, referring to Tradition 4. We don't try to govern each other, as in Tradition 9. And we avoid following personalities rather than principles, as in Tradition 12. On the other side, we avoid things that divert us from our primary purpose. So disunity, referring to Tradition 1, creating facilities that should be separate from AA, as in Tradition 6, employing people to carry the message rather than doing it ourselves, Tradition 8, getting involved with outside issues, Tradition 10, or promotion of AA, Tradition 11. So these fundamental principles about stay connected to each other and to our higher power and stay focused. Stay focused on our primary purpose to carry the message. So AA's 12 steps and 12 traditions are about spiritual principles. 
my 12-step program leads me to start living a principled life. Yeah. These are the things, the types of spiritual principles, the spiritual values that I aspire to by working my 12-step program. And the 12 traditions allow me to bring that into service in AA. Of course, none of us are saints, so we also need some tolerance and patience as well because we're all trying to do the same thing in AA, carry this message to other people. Sometimes we look at these traditions and they seem really intimidating, you know, and sometimes they can be used in the wrong way to sort of say, we can't do this, we can't do this, we've never done that before, we've never tried that before, and they're used to sort of restrict us in a way. But I don't see them as restricting. I see them as liberating. It allows us to keep our focus on what we need to do. They come out of the experience of those early members who made a lot of mistakes. And basically this is a list of things to avoid so we don't make the same mistakes. And so rather than be intimidated by these traditions, be inspired. Because this is what's allowed AA to stay united and grow in all this time. Thanks for letting me share.